I believe for those people that still work, if you are tied with somebody for advancement in an organization and you're good at presenting and they're not, I believe 999 times out of 1,000, you'll get the nod because so many people hate to present. So it's not only good for the class, it's good for your personal life. The number one thing on this list is to remember the audience is your friend. Okay, they're not in their underwear. They're fully clothed, but I just want you to know the people that you're talking to want you to succeed. Those people in your classes, don't you think the majority of those people, 99% of them are looking forward to what you're doing? Do you, do you occasionally get people that are forced to take a class? Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, court ordered or something like that? But they're a minority, right? I mean, they're a small, they're a small number. And, but I address it, I address people if they, does anybody here, does anybody here not want to be here today? And some people will snicker and laugh. I just bring it out right in the open. It's not a big deal, I think you'll enjoy this class. Whether it's one day, two days, six hours, eight hours, however long you do it, I think you'll have a good time. We're gonna have a lot of good experiences here today. Second thing on the list is positive self-talk. Don't talk yourself into a panic attack. Self-talk, and uh, do, do you talk to yourself out loud? You look like a man that does. I tell myself to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what I like to do, I look everybody I possibly can in the eye on the way to the podium. It pre-introduces me, yeah. eye contact. Yeah, eye contact, okay, I'll go along with that. I, uh, I did a thing at uh, a college in, uh, in the Northeast and had a PhD in psychology in my class. And she told me that talking to yourself out loud is normal. What a relief. Yeah. She said you can talk to yourself out loud, ask yourself questions and answer the questions and that's all normal. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, I'm thankful they came out with a Bluetooth because now it just looks like I'm on the phone all the time because <laughs> I, I talk to myself all the time. Number three is meet the people. Now this is something I do a little bit different than you do. I'm, I'm saying, Angela, what you do is great, but I like to get there and, and talk to people. I, just, I, I like to interact with folks a little bit. I used to, I, sometimes I'm by myself and I'll, maybe I'll pace a little bit, but if I can meet some folks, somehow it just calms me down that now I have a smiling face in the crowd to look at and they nod at you. Your whole eye contact thing when you walk up, that's kind of the same thing. You kind of make a connection with somebody when you come up there. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Brian Tracy, has a series called The Psychology of Achievement. I saw this guy speak once, and he said something to me that sort of changed my whole view of this. He said, even when I talk to hundreds of people, I don't stand behind the stage. He said, I stand by the door that they walk in, and I just introduce myself to some of them. He said, because now you have a smiling face in the audience that knows you. And he said, if you shake in somebody's hand beforehand, it's hard not to like a speaker who you've actually met. So I try to engage a little bit beforehand. I like to get there early enough to make sure I see the people. Do you get there early to make sure the people are there and you can move the tables and chairs? If there's a parent with a complaint, that's not a problem. Uh, number four is to see the room beforehand. Uh, I know that many of you teach in the same facility, but I have talked recently to a lot of Hunter Ed instructors and they are put in new situations they've never been at before and they get there on the first day of the class completely unaware of the circumstances. What are the tables and chairs like? Is it air conditioned? Is there electricity? Is it open air? Uh, when I do a keynote speech at a conference and I get in at 10 or 30 or 11 or 11 30 at night, I make the people in the hotel uh, open the room for me and I just want to see it. Why would I want to see the room when I'm getting ready to go to bed? Why would you do that? It takes the stress down. Yeah. Why? You know he said it takes the stress you're down. You're into an environment that you're familiar with as opposed to one that you yes, have no sir. idea what you're walking When into. I go in tonight and go to bed, I I'm I'm no, is there a wireless mic? Am I having to stand behind a lectern? Is there only, I've had, I've had it done before where I didn't do this. And I had a lectern with Mike, and you know I'm a move arounder kind of a guy. Do you like to move when you talk? Oh, yeah. I'm stuck in one place for an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah, I can sleep, and then that way when I go down in the morning, I know if I'm going to make some changes or not. But see the room if you can. Uh, number five is confidence. I want you to have confidence in yourself as a hunter ed instructor, and that comes as this gentleman said earlier from knowledge and, and being prepared. And number six is your appearance. 
Do you ever get drilled on appearance from people? Do they ever, do, do you have a, when you teach, do you have a, what, a, a guidelines you want people to look like when you teach or do you just kind of let them do whatever they want to do? Could I come dressed any way I want as long as I have something orange on or something with camouflage or do you have instructor's vests or do you have instructor's shirts? Sure. You have shirts and vests? Do you have a standard for people though? Here's my point. When somebody walks in that room, they ought to be able to look around the room and see who the presenters are. That's my point. My rule that I tell people is that you should, you should dress a level above the people you're talking to. When I, uh, there are some companies that I talk to in the business community and I wear, will wear a suit and a tie. This is actually fairly dressed up for me to talk to a group of 100 people. I remember the first time I ever got, I mean, I've learned so much doing this. First time I ever was asked to speak to a group, it was, uh, and I had done a presentation beforehand with a suit at a hotel to a committee to see if they wanted me to do this. I mean, it's normal, right? It's a double tree. I thought it was normal. So. A couple weeks later, I did the first seminar in Dodge City, Kansas. Ever been there? Dodge City? About 25 people in the room. I wore a suit and a tie. Hunter Ed instructors. I wore a suit and a tie. Is that embarrassing? Everybody in the room had on camouflage and orange ball caps and t-shirts. It was fairly apparent that I didn't practice what I preach. Now, let me just say this. Anybody can make a mistake, right? I can't explain it. I had been speaking for nine years. I'm a huge person to find out who am I speaking to so I know I can dress appropriately. You understand that? How do I do this? I don't know. I, was, I made a joke out of it. I mean, if you're going to do something stupid, don't you think? Just make a big joke out of it. So the next week, I went to another town and spoke to a group of Hunter Ed people, Hunter Ed instructors. What do you think I wore? No, so I didn't wear camouflage. I should have. I changed the t-shirt. Come on. Come on, man. You know it's not going to happen. I wore an older, sort of a tweed jacket of mine. It was older. It wasn't really new, but it was a jacket. Blue jeans, white button-down collared shirt. It wasn't super pressed, but it was white. And then my cowboy boots. And that was, that was still probably a little overdressed, but it looked appropriate. And that's what I wore when I spoke to this group on and off for the next couple of years. The only reason I'm, I'm looking as nice as I am is for this. What did I say? What's my rule? Just a, level. a level above. Just think about that when you go out there. And so, for, you know, you're going to have a new instructor who's going to look at you and say, well, what should I wear? And you should look at them and say, well, you want them to notice that you're the instructor when you walk in the room. Isn't that right? That's kind of what it is. Number seven is to know the audience. Not know them personally, but I want to know and I don't know if you can find this out. I know different organizations do things different ways, but how many boys, how many girls, how many men, how many women? I need to know just general age groups. I, would, I like to kind of know their attitude. Do they want to be there? Are they captives? What are their backgrounds? How long have they done this? Have they ever even uh, handled a firearm before? Is that relevant information to find out even before you start? Now, I don't want to find out everything because I do like to find out some of the stuff when I teach the class. I think it's kind of fun to talk to people about their background when you teach, but I think it's good to go into it with just a, a little bit of knowledge. And then the, the, uh, the last thing, if you remember earlier, I want you to add an eighth one there. Or actually, I want you to add two more, add an eight and a nine. The eighth one is the one I mentioned earlier that you know more than they do. I think it's a big thing for you to realize. Have confidence in your knowledge when you're talking. You don't need to memorize stuff, but I want you to know the material. And then the last one is, and I think this reflects what you said, sir, is know the material. Know what you're talking about. You don't have to, you don't have to memorize things and know everything. Do you have to be a know? Have you ever worked? Have you ever taught with a know-it-all before? There's nothing more irritating than people that think they have to know everything because you don't. The only people that I really worry about are the ones that think they know everything because that just means they really don't know anything. But I'll tell you something. Most of the folks you talk to are so relieved that you're speaking and they're not, they'll take pretty much anything. Just don't be awful. If you don't get anything else out of what we're talking about here, listen to me now.
There's three words that absolutely guarantee your success when you speak. That's prepare, practice, and rehearse. When I decided to make it a career, I heard of a book called Speak and Grow Rich. You've heard a book called Think and Grow Rich, right? It was by Napoleon Hill years ago. This was written by two women called Speak and Grow Rich. How to make a career out of public speaking. Well, I had been catering for about 11 years and I was tired of it. And the Toastmasters experience was very intriguing to me. So I started reading this book and there's two things when people come to me and I coach people on this all the time, they say, I wanna speak like you do. There's two things I, would, I tell people to do. And one of them is in the book and one of them isn't. The, the one thing I'll tell you that's not in the book that helped me out is they said in the book, you should speak as often as you can for free for two years to get your technique down. So, you know, I didn't really have an opportunity. I wasn't a teacher to college or high school. I mean, if I was, it would have been great. But I had this idea uh, to make three 15-minute canned presentations on attitude, procrastination, and goal setting. They were great presentations. Actually, I've even written articles on these because they're things that people are always interested in, right? I called every Kiwanis Club, Lions Club, Rotary Club, Women's Group in a three-town area. Uh, is anybody here a member of one of those clubs? If you've ever gone, they always look for a guest speaker, don't they? They always look for somebody who can talk for 15 or 20 minutes. You don't get paid, but you get a free lunch out of it. I did that for a year. Finally, on one of the presentations, a person came up to me afterwards and said, you know what? We're having a conference in Charleston, South Carolina, which is about two hours north of where I was living at the time. They said there's going to be 225 people there, and we're looking for a keynote speaker on a topic close to what you're talking about here. They said, would you like to do it? We can't pay you anything. What would you say? Yeah. I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I figured, why not? That's a big group, right? So I hired a camera guy, paid him, we drove two hours up, did this thing with a wireless mic and two hours back, and that gave me my tape to kind of get me, uh, to get me started. My first bit of advice for people that really want to get good at it is, if you only teach Hunter Ed once or twice a year, it's gonna be hard for you to really get good at it. You understand that? I mean, you can, but even if you practice and know your stuff, you know, if you've ever taught classes a lot, you kind of get in a groove, don't you? You're gonna get your, program down. I mean, even over the holidays, there's two or three, there's three or four weeks that I don't present. As many times as I present, when you go, th even me, three or four weeks without presenting, you get a little bit nervous when you get back up there. It's been a while, you know, it's, and it's kind of like riding a bike, it all comes back. But the other thing they told me, are you ready for this? Now, this is what I want you to, to pay attention to. This is what I want you to pay attention to. Those three words right there, they said in the book, for every minute in length of your presentation, you should prepare, practice, and rehearse an hour. I, I can hear the moans and groans out there right now. I did the exact same thing. What do you think? It's not gonna happen, is it? Okay, so let's step back a little bit. Okay, let's be real. I'm gonna tell you something about myself that not everybody knows. My idea of balancing my personal checkbook is to go online and find out generally how much money is in the account. Is anybody else like me on that one? Okay, close. A little bit more, a little bit less than I thought, but it'll even out next month, right? There are some people that have to take the, the computer and the checkbook and account for every penny, which is crazy to me. But Now, you want me to teach a class, 45-minute class on banking and finance at a conference. You want me to teach it. I could see that it would take me 45 hours. Do you get that? because I know nothing about the topic. I would have to read, study, take a course. Now let's take a, a, a Hunter Ed instructor. Let's take somebody, let's take a Hunter Ed instructor that's taught, they're just not very good. Do they know the topic? They pretty, they pretty much know it, they're just not good presenting it, right? So they're gonna teach a 45 minute section. They've taught it before, I'm gonna give them a new section, but they kinda know a little bit about it. Uh, prepare. The first thing down there is it's making notes, making an outline, doing a little research. Do you, do you do your own PowerPoint presentation? Would you? Or do you use a, the one that's handed out to you? I would, okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna say I want you to do your own. I, I want you to be creative, don't, don't look at me like that. You could, you, um, just work with me here. But you can use that one, but if you did your own, if you had something that you wanted to show them, you're gonna to have to do your own slides. That's gonna take a little bit of time. So I mean, if you just look at researching, doing an outline, thinking a little bit, maybe download a couple videos from a site, maybe take some information from the newsletter that's out there, take some information from the PowerPoint they gave you, 45-minute presentation. You know, I probably have five hours into that right there, don't I, really? I mean, if I'm going to do it right. Then practice. That's different from rehearse. Practice is, is going over your open and your close. I don't want you to memorize the presentation, but I want you to have a smooth intro and a smooth close. I want you to study the material and know it. Know your notes and your outlines. That's going to take another couple hours. We're up to seven. Now, if you've never presented before, how many times did I say I wanted you to present to the team? Twice. I said twice. three, twice. Three would be great, but they would never do it. So I want, to, I want you to present, so that's 45 minutes, right? And then we'll give you feedback for probably 30 minutes. That's an hour and 15 minutes. Then I want you to present a second time based on our feedback. And then we'll give you more feedback. That's another hour and 15 minutes. So that's two and a half hours on top of seven. So for a 45 minute, it's not 45 hours, but it's 10 hours, isn't it? Maybe less because you're, you're, you've been around the organization. You're probably still going to put in five or six. So let's just say not an hour per minute, but 15 minutes per minute. And you know what? Almost nobody does that. I haven't taught in a couple months. I'm going to get a cup of coffee and I'm going to look over this stuff in the morning before I go out and do it or I'm going to do it the night before and then they're nervous, they forget stuff, they sweat, their mouth gets dry. You understand what I'm talking about? There's so many ways to get around this. There's no reason in the world why somebody can't take a section and get really good at it. Now, if it's a new person, there's no option. You're going to have to do it. If you're experienced, but you're not very good at it, uh, your ability to give them feedback depends on how they receive it. Isn't that right? Because some people can take it and some people cannot take it very good. Uh, I don't know, do you folks ever videotape yourselves sometimes just for the fun of it? You know what I'd like to do? I think you should say, the next time you teach, I think you should hand somebody your phone. Do you have a smartphone? And say, just record about 10 minutes of me. Just let me see what it looks like. Has anybody ever seen themselves on videotape before? It's awful, okay? <laughs> it's the worst experience you've ever seen. I've watched about 10 hours of myself this year and it takes me about two weeks to get my self-esteem back after I watch it, you know? But I mean, how else are you gonna get better, isn't that right? The nine simple steps to solve the presentation puzzle. You have to know your purpose for why you're there. You create the clothes first. Isn't that interesting, why first? Why do you create the clothes first? Well, what? what? It's a summary, it shows everything that's going to be there. He said when to quit, what'd you say? It's a summary, it shows everything that you're going to be going over. They're going to remember the clothes more so than anything else. Yes. I want you to do an exercise for me on that piece of paper. You have some room. I want you to draw a picture, either on page eight or page seven, either one. I want you to draw a picture for me. Uh, this is an example of an exercise I do sometimes to open a seminar, but you get the chance to actually do it, so you should be excited for this. I want you to draw a picture. I'm going to give you instructions. You are getting excited, I can tell. <laughs> you want me to draw? Yeah. <laughs> I want you to draw. Listen, I'm going to give you instructions. I want you to draw whatever you think I mean. You interpret it yourself. I'm not going to answer any questions at all. Uh, you're just going to have to figure it out on your own. And uh, if, you're, if you're not a morning or afternoon person, you're just going to have to look over on the person next to you because I'm not helping. <laughs> now, if you, if you want to, I will give you one hint to make it a little bigger than smaller because people tend to make this thing too small. First thing I want you to draw is a straight line. And on the right side of that line, I want you to draw something that looks like a banana. No, I'm sorry, something that looks like a triangle. On the right side of the line, something that looks like a triangle. And inside the triangle, make a small eye. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. What kind of eyes he talking about? Underneath that triangle, I want you to draw something that looks like a banana. Underneath the triangle, draw something that looks like a banana. And inside the banana, 
I want you to write the word sale. And under the banana, I want you to draw six script C's attached to each other. Six cursive C's under the banana. Cursive C's under the banana. Does anybody remember what a cursive C is? You know what it is? Barely. You do? Does anybody here have children, young children? I've heard, tell me teach it anymore. Some states I've run into, they are, but most states are not. Isn't that amazing? Did they tell you how that kid's supposed to sign their name? He asked me that yesterday. X. Sign X. <laughs> X. That's it, isn't it? Some people said, you just do it online. I don't know. It's a weird deal. But what I want you to do is uh, share the drawing that you had with the people that you were in the group with and see if it's similar or different. See if you have the same drawing or see if it's similar. <laughs> yeah. Most people will. The only weird thing is the eyeball. Some people had the letter I. But there's, you have components of this, but you don't have this. Now, how many of you, now this is to make your point, right, why you do the clothes first. How many of you would have had this, if I would have said, I'm gonna give you some instructions, I want you to draw whatever you, whatever you think I mean, you interpret it yourself. I'm not gonna answer any questions, make it bigger than smaller, but our goal is to draw a sailboat where the things I said have made more sense. Uh, Stephen Covey said this in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Principle number five is begin with the end in mind. That's why you do it. So I, I, want, I want, and listen, if you're teaching one 45 minute section, you might not really have an official close. I would like to end in some smooth way. You know what I mean by a close? You might, you might review information, you might have a story. But if you are the uh, head instructor, or the lead instructor, you should definitely open your class with something that's engaging and you should close it. And I know every state's a little bit different, but rather than just have them take the test and leave, I like them to end with something that's memorable that they can tell people about. I want something impactful when they walk away. That's what the close is. You design the opening next, you outline the body, We'll talk about that, I did, I, and I like the fact you use the manual, but I do like you to make your outline on a separate sheet of paper. Those are your own notes. You add spice, those are things that make it interesting. There's stories, you folks, uh, you ever do show and tell? Pass around something, show it, you ever show a video clip? Maybe something the state has that they gave you that's very interesting. You spice up your presentation, you're supposed to spice it up every six to eight minutes with something. Visualize, that's your visual aids. Whether it's a PowerPoint, flip chart, all kinds of, we'll talk about that when we get there. Tailor to the audience, I wanna make sure I'm hitting everybody right at their level. Make cheat sheets, cheat sheets are your notes, and then rehearse, and again, if you're really experienced at this, like the people I'm talking to now, you might not really rehearse unless it's a whole brand new topic, but when you have less experienced people or people that, what if you have an instructor that only teaches once a year? Should they rehearse that before they go teach it? Don't you think, or two, two times a year, even three times a year? I mean, even if I teach four or five times a year, I should probably do something of my own at my house and practice this a little bit. And that's, that's what's gonna make everybody good. Speaker distractions, wanna guess? Pacing. What, pacing? Yeah, that's one. Pacing. pacing is one, write that down, that's a good one, pacing. I didn't have that down, but I think that's a good one. Pacing. And one that I have, have you ever seen people jiggle change in their pockets? Oh, it sounds weird and it looks weird. I used to have people do this. Where's my thing? Hold on. I know I'm gone. Hang on. I've seen people do this. I used to do this. When they're speaking, they do this or, or they're doing this kind of stuff. Speakers. It's bad enough when you're doing it, okay? I mean, I've had people click things in the class and I about slapped the pen out of their hand, but I didn't. <laughs> but, but you've got to, so uh, listen, I've, um, I don't know if you watch basketball, but Digger Phelps for ESPN, he always has a, a marker that's the same color as his tie, if you've never noticed that before. But he has, he didn't click it, but he has to have it in his hand constantly. I guess if, you know, if you're, if you're that successful and you can do it, go ahead, I just think it's a crutch. I don't think you need to have that. And when I do this, after I use a board, 
I have to actually make myself set that thing down there or else I'll fiddle with it, which could, can't, I don't know if it distracts you, but it could be a distraction to you. Some ladies twirl their hair when they get nervous. That's a distraction. Or some people play with their fingernails when they speak. Some people give handouts. You know handouts. Do you give out handouts? When you give out handouts, should you give them at the beginning, the middle, or the end? Now, I do at the beginning because I want you to take notes. If all I want you to do is listen to me and you don't have to write anything down, everything I'm saying is in the information I'm going to hand you at the end, just listen to me and when you're on your way out, you can pick up a handout. But 9 out of 10 times, 19 out of 20, I'll give you the thing first. And if you thumb through it while I'm speaking, that just means I'm not doing a very good job. If you thumb through it before I speak, some people like to look through the workbook and see what they have. I think that's great. You know, you can see what you're faced with. But that can be a distraction. Now, environmental distractions, we've talked about it. It could be the temperature. It could be late people. It could be people in sidebars talking to each other in a class. Have you ever had that happen? It's distracting. And listen, if it's a comment, it doesn't bother me, but it goes on and on and on. It's distracting the people around you. Some people are so inconsiderate. It actually just, I still don't get it sometimes. Some folks are so selfish and self-centered that they've never learned how rude that can be. Now, the questions and answer period, the, uh, I set the ground rules early for the question and answer period. And, I, and do you like questions as the class goes on? Or do you want me to hold it to the end? Which do you prefer? Do you want them to ask you during your presentation? Well, at the end of the presentation, but then each presentation has Do I have to hold my question till the end, or can I ask you if I'm confused in the middle? If you're confused, I just tell them, raise your hand okay. you know, if you don't understand what I'm saying. Does that sound fair? Does anybody like the questions held to the end? By the end, they're too busy trying to remember their questions yeah. as you're talking. But, but I just, that's something what they're saying is list that stuff out. Tell them how you want this to happen at the beginning. And let me just say this, folks. There are, there are some people in this room right now that are more outspoken than others. I can tell that already. But don't leave here with a question that you have. Don't worry if you think your question is stupid. And let me tell you something, folks. I'll tell you right now. I don't want anybody's question laughed at in this room. You understand that? I don't want anybody to be intimidated to ask questions. We're talking about some serious stuff. It's fun, but I want, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I do at the beginning to get them to relax because people are so introverted and shy, particularly some of the youngest kids, they just won't ask a question. Just ask it, man. And listen, if you don't want to ask it, come see me at the break and you can ask me and I'll bring it up to the class when we come back. Yeah. Hunter safety, age-wise, knowledge-wise, uh, everything else that you you gotta respect those questions because what to you is just common knowledge that everybody ought to know to this person over here they've never heard of. Right, exactly. You repeat the question. You agree with that, so everybody can hear it. Actually, it gives me a chance to think of an answer too. Could you repeat that, please? Or I'll repeat it for them. Um, what if you don't know the answer? No. I don't know. I don't know. Listen, let me get my guys in the back here. Do any of you guys know this answer? Let me give it a shot. I've even done this before. But you know what? That's a great question. Does anybody in the class want to take a shot at that first? Because in my mind, I have no idea what they're talking about. Maybe I can agree with someone in the audience. Nobody really knows for sure. Does anybody here have a smartphone? Who has a smartphone in here? Would you do me a favor and look up that answer for me? Okay, you're off the grid right now. Look up that answer. Let me know when you have it. I couldn't do that in the past. I used to have to wait till the break or make a phone call. I had this one, we were talking about how badly people talk negatively about people behind their backs. Happens in just about every working environment. And I asked the class, have you ever heard the phrase, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything? Have you ever heard that? I said, who said that? And most people say, my mother, my grandmother. We were talking about it, nobody knew for sure, and I continued on with teaching. And this guy in about the eighth row back there put his hand in the air, he had a smartphone. He said that came from the movie Bambi in 1942. It was a six-year-old German child, and it wasn't Thumper's mother, it was Thumper's father, Thumper's father. I mean, all this is Christ said, thank you very much. I've used that in every seminar for like seven years since he said that. Yeah, I was just looking up the answer. I didn't even ask him to. He said, uh, Bambi was trying to walk on the ice and Thumper was making fun of Bambi that he couldn't walk on the ice and Thumper's mother said, what did your father always tell you? So now you got something new. The ping pong question is when he answers a question and I answer it, he answers and I answer it 
and he asks another one and I answer it and we're having the best time in the world here. I feel that this room is very interactive, but everybody else is bored stiff. I'll work with this guy for about a couple of questions or maybe a minute. Then I'm going to say, you know what, uh, does anybody else know the answer to this? Or, you know, we've got to move on to another thing. Let's talk about this at the break. If anybody, anybody wants to join us, you can. But there's a technique for handling all this stuff. The body language right here. Does anybody have a question? Does anybody have a question? How about you folks in the back? Do you have a question? It's better than this. Well, that's all I have uh, for my presentation here. Um, does anybody, anybody have uh, any questions? All right, well, let me turn it over to Jerry over here. It's just, you could tell, do they want questions? You could tell they don't want questions. I want questions. And if you really want questions, set somebody up in the back to ask a question for you. You're on my team. If nobody asks, would you ask a question for me in the back? I can get a lot going. Or I can say, well, you know what? You're not asking any questions. Can I tell you the three questions I get every time I teach this class? I'm going to start asking questions. This is one. Who, now, who in this room, be honest with me, thought about this during my presentation, this question right here, and you'll get a couple people raise their hands. You, you did think of it, didn't you? Why didn't you ask the question? Well, what's your question then? And I'll get them involved and we'll kid around a little bit and it's kind of fun. It's kind of edgy though, isn't it? I'm on the borderline. You might not be able to do it. I don't know if you're good enough. If there's no questions, I can handle it. Uh, look out for bad habits. Vocal interferences. These are, here you go, ready? What are they? Ums, ahs, ums, ahs, and so, like, okay. okay. Like is a big one for kids now, isn't it though? It's wild, man. It's like, what was like, it was like, yes, we went out hunting. It was like, cool. We went like down the road and was like, what? And he was like, yes. It was like, I just shot and missed. And it was like, whoa. I mean, have you ever, I stopped somebody the other day and said, what are you saying instead of that? I mean, leave the like out of it. What would happen to the conversation? But, and I, I don't expect you to be perfect with this, but, but you've heard it before that it becomes a distraction. Vocabulary noise, and I mentioned this earlier, this is you experienced folks. That is jargon, acronyms, some people like to use, have you ever talked to a person that likes to use big words? Mayonnaise. Just, what's that? Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise? That's a big word. Okay, thank <laughs> you. I'm gonna have to remember that one, thank you very much. You don't say much, but when you do, it's powerful. <laughs> Emotional noise is uh, number one, and I mentioned this earlier, apologizing. You were just mind wandering for a second there. See, I'm watching out for people, taking care of folks, write that down. Is that pushy? It is a little bit, isn't it? A bit okay, so it's all right, I want you to do it. This is my job to make sure you get this, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Apologizing, admitting your nervousness, and then being negative in front of other people. I don't think you have to smile and be happy all the time, but I need you to be upbeat when you're up here. You're the leader of the whole room when you're up here. Everybody's counting on you. Uh, give them a break. How often do you give them breaks? At least every 50 minutes. Yeah, 45, 50, 55. I mean, when you think about it, that's how long our classes were when we were in school, weren't they? And then you state the schedule, the breaks, you tell them how often, you tell them how long. Synchronized watches. I like to tell people if we're going to take about a... Now, I've been loose with you folks today, but normally in a real seminar, I would say it's 2.22 in the afternoon. Let's take a 15-minute break and come back at 2.37. It's just something that breaks that thing up rather than let's take about a 15-minute break, which usually turns into about a 20-minute break. And, and you can have a... It's up to you at about a minute before the break is up. Just start calling them back in. Get the people out in the hallway. Could you mind getting those folks out there?